When the name Helmut Lang is mentioned, the first thing that comes to mind for most people is a sort of silent rebellion within the fashion industry. He brought minimalism and androgyny to the forefront and made really everyday ordinary garments cool. But ever since his departure from the brand and the world of fashion altogether in 2005, pretty much all of that has been lost, leaving us with poor creative direction, money hungry designs, and one burning question. How did this all happen? <laughs> Hey guys, I hope everyone is doing well. If you're new around here, my name is Jackson and I make videos about fashion. I'm currently trying to shift my content to be way more informational and journalistic, so if you're into that kind of thing, make sure you subscribe down below. Helmut Lang has been one of my favorite designers for a long time now, so recently I've just been taking in a lot of information and doing a lot of research about him. Particularly, I've been really interested in how the brand got to where it is today. If you look at Helmut Lang now, it is nothing like the way it used to be. So today's video is pretty much just gonna be a timeline of the rise and fall of Helmut Lang. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. So Helmut's parents divorced at a very young age and that forced him to live with his grandparents in rural Austria before he moved to the country's capital, Vienna, at age 10 because his dad remarried and he went to live with him. In Vienna, he became inspired by the people he saw on the street and he was particularly amazed by uniforms, which would be something that would reoccur throughout his collections. He went to a trade school in Vienna and he aspired to be an artist in the Viennese art scene. He grew unsatisfied with a lot of the clothes that were readily available to him, so he started to make simple everyday garments like t-shirts just for himself. Those caught the attention of a lot of his friends and then later garnered a lot of local attention in Vienna. And that local attention led to him opening his first made-to-measure studio in 1977 before opening a shop where he sold his own clothing designs in 1979. And so as he was gaining a lot of popularity in Vienna and throughout the European fashion scene, he was invited to show his first official runway show in Paris in 1986. This was so huge for him because this came at a time when a lot of fashion was based on very maximalist, over-the-top, glamorous designs that were just getting old. I mean, of course there were people like Rei Kawakubo and Yoji Yamamoto who brought the avant-garde into the Paris fashion system, but there was still a need for change and Helmut Lang was just that. Ever since that first spring-summer 1987 collection, Helmut's designs offered a new minimalistic, seemingly ordinary approach to the anti-fashion spirit. He made seemingly everyday, ordinary garments like denim jeans and t-shirts new and unique in his own way, and he was really the first person to make those things high fashion. And he really did this by using unconventional technical fabrics and using details like bondage and paint splatter to sort of incorporate a punk spirit into those pieces. He really created a sort of post-punk uniform and catered to those former punks who really couldn't wear what they used to because they had a desk job now, but they still wanted a way to kind of silently rebel against the norm with what they wore. Some of the most iconic and recognizable pieces from this era are the paint splatter jeans, parkas, bulletproof vests, and the infamous 2004 nipple tank top. So fast forward to August of 1999 after several successful collections from Helmet, the Prada Group came in and purchased 49% of the brand's shares. This was part of a sort of buying spree that also included Prada acquiring Jill Sander. And this is exactly when the fall of Helmet Lang began. From 1999 to 2003, the brand sales dropped over 60%. This was mostly because of Prada cutting back on the denim line, which is possibly one of the worst decisions they could have made. The denim line made up for over 50% of sales, and they tried to replace that with a women's accessory line, a fragrance line, and also a shoe line, I believe, all of which pretty much flopped. Prada really just failed to push both the image and financial aspects of Helmet Lang, and that just led to sales absolutely tanking. And in October of 2004, Prada came in and purchased the remaining 49% of shares, which gave them absolutely full control over the brand. I actually have a pretty ironic quote from the CEO of Prada, Patrizio Bertelli. He said, taking complete control of the Helmet Lang group is a clear demonstration of how strongly we believe in the potential of the brand. So pretty much he says he believes in the potential of the brand, but literally ruined any potential the brand had in the first place. And all of this led to Helmet himself leaving the brand in 2005. There were a lot of rumors of disagreements between him and Prada, which are definitely justifiable. I mean, if somebody came in and absolutely wrecked my brand in a matter of four years, I think I'd be pretty pissed. By May of that same year, Prada deemed the brand unprofitable and looked to put the mess they made in somebody else's hands. After about a year of talk about selling the brand, they finalized a deal with Theory Link Holdings, which is a Tokyo-based house which has its own namesake brand called Theory. 
It's in a lot of higher end malls, I guess you could say. In theory, Link Holdings still owns Helmet Lang to this day, but ever since Helmet himself left, there have been a slew of creative directors who came in and tried to revive the brand but most of them miserably failed. First of all, right after Helmet left in 2005, Michael and Nicole Kolovos came in and took over creative direction. They were actually a designer couple, which I think is pretty interesting, and they stayed at the brand until 2014 when they branched out to create their own brand. Their work at the brand was just kind of boring in my opinion. It kind of seemed like a failed attempt to recreate the past and it really just wasn't consistent with the energy that Helmet brought to the table. I can't really say much about their work, it just was kind of boring and I did like some of the fall 2009 collection but it still just wasn't Helmet Lang. But then in early 2017, Isabella Burley, who was the editor-in-chief of Dazed and Confused magazine, was brought in as editor-in-residence. She was pretty much the creative director, except the only thing she didn't do from what I understand is actually design the clothes. But she pretty much had full control over all of the brand's decisions. And early that year, Isabella Burley made the very questionable decision of bringing in Travis Scott to be designer of a capsule collection. Yes, the rapper Travis Scott. This collection included a cluster of different graphics made for real ragers only, and it looked like one of those kind of cheap streetwear brands you could see today. Most of it honestly just looked like it could have been Travis Scott merch. There were literally shirts with just his face printed on the front. There were also these ugly sneakers that looked like those Supra skate shoes. I don't know what they were thinking with these. It was obvious that the label just needed funds and this was definitely a quick and easy way to do it. They took a rising name in pop culture and just associated his image with a lazy collection and it sold. The cash grab only continued that year with their infamous re-edition collection where they made 15 of the most iconic archive pieces that Helmet made himself and just re-released them and made them more available to the people who didn't want to pay the resale prices of older pieces. This is something that a lot of brands have done and will continue to do. Most recently, Raf Simmons announced that they're doing that whole Redux collection except instead of 15 pieces, it's 100 so it's on a much bigger scale. In my opinion, brands can do a lot worse things than this. It was pretty clear that the brand was just going through a rebuild phase and they just needed to make as much money as possible in as short a time as possible and that's pretty much exactly what they did. But then in September of 2017, Hood by Air's Shane Oliver put his own brand on pause to design the spring-summer 2018 collection for Helmet Lang. He brought the very sexual spirit of Hood by Air and fused it with some silhouettes that you might see Helmet himself use. There was a lot of leather and bondage details and geometric cuts which showed a ton of skin which is something Helmet liked to do as well. I will say that the collection was a little bit more like Hood by Air than Helmet Lang, but it sure was a lot more interesting and better than what they had been doing recently. Things were very androgynous, which is Shane Oliver's trademark, and the modeling cast was very diverse and unique. So after that collection, there was a period of more than a year with no Helmet Lang runway shows. I'm sure they were just kind of planning for the future, but in this time they were selling these really lazy graphic tees with things like this on them. So yeah. And Isabella Burley had a pretty short run at the brand. In early 2019, she was replaced by Alex Brown, who was the founder of V Magazine. And right away, they brought on two designers named Mark Thomas and Thomas Cawson. Mark Thomas had worked at brands like Givenchy and Neil Barrett, so not exactly like Helmut Lang. But Thomas Cawson actually worked under Raph in the denim line at Calvin Klein, which is pretty interesting. Their stuff kind of felt like a different form of re-edition to me. Instead of just straight up recreating the pieces, they kind of tried to put a spin on them, but still kept them pretty close to the original. This can be seen throughout the parkas, denim jackets, sheer fabrics, tank tops, and things like that. Thomas and Cawson still remain at the head of design to this day, and their work hasn't been horrible in my opinion, but it kind of just seems like they're trying to call back to Helmet's design ethos and just using different color palettes and things like that. But keep in mind, they're still just plastering Helmet Lang's name onto t-shirts, hoodies, and sweatpants and things like that. It just seems pretty lazy and it seems like they have fallen into the pit of consumerism. Amid this whole pandemic actually, they did a t-shirt design contest based around the theme of staying home. Here are 14 of the over 2,000 submissions. The three winners who would actually get their shirts sold by the brand were determined by how many Instagram likes they got. I think this is a pretty accurate representation of where the brand stands today and a perfect way to cap off the fall of Helmet Lang. 
I figured I'd end this video on a positive note by talking about what Helmet has been doing for the past 15 years since leaving fashion. He shifted his focus to sculptural art, which was actually his passion in the first place, so I think it's pretty cool to see everything come full circle for him. His first major art exhibition in 2011 was actually him destroying 6,000 of his original archive pieces and making them into these sort of pillar-like sculptures. It was pretty much just a big middle finger to the fashion industry. I have a quote from him saying, I had done what I had to do in fashion. It was successful and a great experience, but I wanted to do more in art. I said, if I don't do it now, let it go. Words to live by. And I've actually heard a few rumors about him wanting to come back to fashion at some point. I don't know how valid those rumors are, so take that with a grain of salt, but I just wanted to put that out there as well. I left the link to his art website as well as a recent interview down below in the description. You can see all of his past and current works and I think it's just super cool to see what he's been doing. I highly encourage all of you to go check that out if you're interested in what he's been doing since leaving fashion. It's really cool to see how he kind of took that energy and identity and just incorporated it into a different form of art. So that is pretty much going to wrap up my video about the rise and fall of Helmut Lang. If you enjoyed and learned something, which I hope you did, leave a thumbs up and subscribe down below. Also follow my Instagram at Jackson Cray. I love you all. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one.